everybody, it's Jennifer Chamberlain with Artists Unlimited. This is the home of the Maker Beehive. And just a mosh of technique and process and products and fun stuff that I do in order to get crafty with paper and paint. Mixed media. I love mixed media. Mixed media means we are breaking the boundaries between all kinds of stuff that is used to create art. And so we can mix paints and we can mix stamps and we can mix stencils and we can mix paper and fabric and buttons and everything so today we're going to start off with one of my very very favorite things to do when it comes to mixed media and that's work with paper i mean paper is everything i love paper <laughs> so many things you can make with it and if you are a former scrapbooker like i am i am guessing maybe you have a stash of paper somewhere right <laughs> stuff that you haven't used. Um, a lot of us scrapbooked back in the 90s, early 2000s, and have a lot of leftover paper from that. But I still really, really enjoy creating my own papers when, it, when I know that I'm going to be doing something like the pumpkins. So all of these little sections are papers that I created myself. So I'll give you a little close up. All these little sections, they were created first and then cut out and reassembled. So, so much fun. It's one of my favorite things to do. Sometimes I do making the papers and painting papers and using my gel plate, even when I don't have a project in mind, just because the process is so fun. And so I'm gonna take you through using a gel plate. That's what I have in front of me. This is 12 inches by 12 inches. I still have some dried paint on here from before. So we're gonna pick up some of that dried paint. We're gonna put some other paint on there too. When you use a gel plate, what is a gel plate? Well, it's this jelly square. You see, it's just like gel. And you see colors through it that I've used before. And it's just, it kind of gives a little when you press on it. And so you get this really organic look of picking up different paints. So when you layer paints and then you put your paper on it, press your paper on there and pull, you get this, you just get every single time a surprise, a new gift, a new patterned paper or colored paper that you can use in your project that's totally unexpected, totally a surprise, totally like it, you have to let go of control and just let it be organic. And I love that about the gel press. You can also just, if you don't have a gel plate, you don't have to gel, have a gel plate to do mixed media. You don't have to have a gel plate to even do this pumpkin project. You can simply take your papers, take some paints, and smush around some colors. Honestly, it's gonna be fine. But I just thought we'd take advantage of this time today to just demonstrate to you what a gel plate is and um, how fun it can be. I also, for this particular project, chose to use brown paper, as you can see. Brown paper. See? So either like a brown paper grocery bag, my brown paper happened to come from a shipment. It was something was wrapped in the brown paper. So you don't have to buy anything new for your paper. I like the brown paper for the pumpkin project because it already kind of has that neutral kind of old organic, you know, natural look to it. And because I'm going to be putting orange on it, some I want some pretty deep, rich colors in this. It's easier to get that on the brown paper than it is on a white paper. So that's what I'm going to use. So this has dried at this point. You can just see, I can just rub my hand across there and not pick anything up. And so to reactivate that dried layer, I need to put on some wet paint. And when I put on wet paint, because acrylic paint, which is what I'm using now, because acrylic paint is um, water soluble, I can apply it to this and it's gonna reactivate this gold here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go in and see what I get. I'm just gonna play around with some pumpkin colors. This is actually yellow ochre on here already. So I was playing with that earlier and I got something like this. I still had some orange underneath. I even picked up a little bit of blue. I love that. And I'm just gonna show you really quick. We'll do just one demonstration of picking up some um, color on our paper. And then I'll show you how I use those papers in the pumpkin itself. So what I'm using right now is Deco Art. Americana paint in warm, what was it? 
Warm Sunset. It's one of their newer colors. The reason I like Warm Sunset is because it's a nice opaque orange. Sometimes oranges, yellows, and reds come in very transparent colors, um, very transparent finish. It's really hard to get good coverage. Have you experienced that before where you are using an orange or a yellow and a red and it's really, really difficult to get good coverage? You go in with like multiple layers and um, is the video frozen? Somebody says the video is frozen. frozen. Somebody says refresh, just refresh. Okay, so I'm just pressing, putting a lot of pressure on my paper here. I rolled my, this is, okay, this is what I've shared before, but this is, some people say you need to use a brayer with a gel plate, a brayer. It's this really fancy roller that you just roll across to put your paint on, or you roll across your paper to press, press it on there really well. I actually use my Pampered Chef dough roller. I rarely have ever used it for dough, and I don't use it for dough anymore, that's for sure. So now I'm pull, pulling this off. I pulled up some of the yellow ochre. I pulled up some of the orange. I even pulled up some brown and some other colors that I've had on there before. So this is a gel press print. And we're going to use this in our pumpkin. And the cool thing is you can keep going back and getting more and more color. So here's one that I did where there's a lot of layered color here. A little bit of red, a little bit of blue coming out. Um, here is one a little darker. I actually put a little piece of a book page on there just for fun. This one I added a little bit of green. And so what I was going for is that I wanted one pumpkin that was mostly orange and one pumpkin that was more neutral, you know, like those white ivory pumpkins. I really love those pumpkins. And so I want a little contrast between my two pumpkins. So each section is a little bit different. So I color the papers first, either paint them or use your gel press or whatever, however you want to color your own papers. But then I cut those papers into the sections for the pumpkin. Mary says, I have that roller. My granddaughter uses it for Play-Doh. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. So I'm gonna go in with some more color, and this time I'm gonna do orange again. And remember, when your layers dry, you need a wet layer to reactivate the dry layers underneath. So when you're using a gel plate, it's a good idea. If you want multiple layers, you have to let those layers dry in between. If you try to go in too soon and you're not patient, which I'm not always perfectly patient, you're gonna lift up the paint underneath and just mess everything up. So it's best to let it dry in between. I'm putting a little bit of burnt umber on here as well. I'm just gonna darken it up just a little bit. And because those paints were still wet, they're gonna kind of blend into each other, which is fine. I kind of just want a really dark orange this time. I'm going to go in with this piece. I'm just going to rip a piece of my brown paper. Press as hard as I can. And I love that the brown paper, you see how it's wrinkling? There's no need to worry about it being perfectly smooth. Those wrinkles will look great on a pumpkin skin. It just looks good. Embracing the imperfection. That's what it's all about. Oh, nice. Look at that. Look at that. That looks so good. So we can get several slices for the pumpkin out of that. So good. And you can continue to go back and layer more and layer more. I can take this piece and still get a good, a good print out of what's left here. Got a little orange there. And I love that it's on the brown paper so that if you don't get full coverage, you still have a natural color kind of coming through for your pumpkin. Isn't that cool? So here is one that I did earlier. I love this particular lift. Isn't that cool? And I'm going to show you how I'm going to add even more to it. 
So I'm taking my distress ink and distress ink is simply exactly what it sounds like. It's an ink that you use to distress things. Maybe it's like the edge of something. So I used it on the edge of my project here. It gave it kind of that vignette around my project. It just gives it that more like a vintage kind of feel. I'm gonna use it to stencil. Um, also, a lot of times people will ask me, what's the difference between a distress ink and a distress oxide? Here's the simple difference. A distress ink is great on its own. It's great to distress, to add a little, you know, blended effect around something. But an oxide almost acts more like a paint, even though it's not a paint. They are more opaque, and you can layer them, blend them like a paint, and but they're really easy to work with. They're great to stencil with and stuff like that. So I'm going to actually do a demonstration on the difference later this week as part of this. So we'll get into that later. So what I'm doing is I'm taking my blending tool. This is called a blending tool. And you can use this with your inks and your oxides. And I'm going to use it to stencil a little design on my printed papers my paper that I just made out of brown craft paper that came out of a box. Packaging material, just packaging material. Part of what I love about mixed media and you know the way I do it and my philosophy is use what you've got. I love how the girls in my group will say, I'm looking at the paper around me in a whole new way. I mean, for this technique, you could seriously take an envelope from your mail that you're gonna throw away, your junk mail, um, any kind of paper, literally anything, paper grocery bag, anything you would otherwise throw away. So this, I just did that little stencil technique with my Distress ink. It still is nice and neutral, but it adds a little interest. It's going to make a beautiful little piece of my pumpkin. Isn't that fun? And some of this, you know, there's not a lot of color over here. You just get that brown paper bag, but that's okay. That's still going to be beautiful. And so when it comes time to making the sections, We'll, I'll just have this little piece. It's just just brown brown paper, but how pretty is that? And to think, you know, when you saw this, would you have ever imagined that all this was was smushing paint, making a mess, really, making a beautiful mess on a piece of brown paper. I love using brown paper. So when I go to the grocery store and they're like paper or plastic or whatever, I'm always like, paper, of course. I need the paper. I need that brown paper. It comes in so handy. Sometimes I even like, this, look at this, by the way, this is the back of a pad of paper. It's a nine inch by 12 inch back of a pad of paper. I created directly on this. It makes a beautiful canvas for mixed media because it's so sturdy. It's chipboard. See? And I love working on that. You never would have known that. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, right? So sometimes I will even just cut a grocery bag into the size that I want, collage on it, make myself a nice little background for a mixed media project, and use that and frame it or whatever. It doesn't have to be fancy. It does not have to be fancy. I, I am totally believe in using what you have, repurposing, reusing in the sisterhood. We have done paper dolls. We have done luminary houses. What else, ladies? So I just got a little bit of green paint on there. Not enough, I don't think. I don't know if that's going to reactivate it. But can you see that little bit of green? A little bit more. So what I'm doing by putting this acrylic paint that's wet on the dry is reactivating the dry stuff. It's going to actually seep through there reactivate it all and all of those layers I hope are going to pull up not all of them but a lot of them and and the fact that it's not all of them is what makes it so cool because it's just going to be like little pieces and again you can see my paper wrinkling up I don't care and so what happens with the gel plate is that it picks up everything from the front back I'm going to push harder I'm having to reach my muscles in it so there we have we picked up some of the gold we picked up some of the orange this is going to make a beautiful piece to our pumpkin right here that's a great lift right there 
I picked up some orange. I picked up some of the burnt umber from way back. It kind of toned down my green. You can see where it's just got a dirty green look. Look over here. Isn't that pretty? So what I mean by the gel plate being able to lift off. So you see how much we lifted from underneath? So let's go now to... Mm, doo -doo -doo -doo. I think I'm going to go to my antique white and we'll try to even get more on another piece. I'm almost out. I love antique white. So I'm going to go a little more generous this time because I really want to try to activate all this paint underneath. Sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to get all of it out. That's cool, a cool pattern. Okay, so I'm just gonna roll that. So what you're gonna find is the paper is gonna pull that white, but it's also going to pull those layers that are underneath and the layers the first layer that was put on here, the most dry layer, the very first layer, is going to be what we see in the front of our papers. It's what's going to be on the top layer of our paper. The bottom layer of the gel plate will be the top layer on your printed paper. So I'm really pressing hard, picking up all that dried paint with my antique white. Oh, yeah. This is the fun. Look at that. Look at that. How cool is that? We got a little bit of green. Look up real close. There's a little bit of green, just like a pumpkin would be. There might be a little bit of green. We've got some of that orange, some darker, some lighter. We've got a little burnt umber even mixed in there. We can actually see the grocery bag right there. Doesn't matter. That looks like natural color. But look, look at all this. So many different options. So when you look at our pumpkin now, see that? Now we can totally see how that is going to become this. On here, a little bit of burnt umber. So you can see all of the different colors on here. But then I did the white stenciling before I cut it. These, this here, I did a little stenciling here. Oh, actually, that's stamping. That stamping, I stamped a piece here before it was cut. So I had a whole piece. It's this right here. This piece. So this, just some orange paint on brown paper. I took a black stamp. It's this stamp. It's a rubber stamp here, and it has like this cursive writing on it. And I just took it all over, and that is what made this piece. It's small, but it really adds to the whole effect. And then, I think we did this in the beginning here, where we did this stencil, and that will make a great little piece on this pumpkin, right? Um, this is a beautiful piece. This is the one that we just painted. That still looks really good. So that is what the gel plate does. And so once you learn how to create your own papers and you play with it because this is just a small example <laughs> of how you can create your own paper. For me, it's not just about creating a full project. It's about all those little things that go into it. Reusing stuff, repurposing things, the hunt for the perfect book page or saying or something that I want to put in my background collage. Um, the play, the experimentation, trying new products mixed with other stuff, you know, paints with crayons or watercolors with whatever. So just mixing it all up. Hey, everybody, it's Jennifer Chamberlain with Artists Unlimited, the home of the Maker Bee Hive. Welcome to day two of our mixed media fall festival. And I'm calling it a fall festival because we're learning a bunch of different techniques and processes that may empower you and make you feel confident enough to create 
this little pumpkin mixed media. This is just a really quick review. And these are the papers we made yesterday. So go back and look at that. And this was just done with some paints. We did use a gel plate, G-E-L-P-A-L-A-T-E, a gel plate. Love my gel plate. But then we also talked about how if you don't have a gel plate, just sit down and smush some paints around on your papers. Use some stencils and some stamps, which is in this case I use stamps. In this case, we did a reverse stamp. Remember that? I just, I love this technique. There's barely any paint on here. And then I used my rubber stamp. It was this one to pull some paint off. And then when we pressed it on our jelly plate, we got this kind of reverse negative effect. And I love that. So when I go to the grocery store, they're always going to, they automatically want to put it in plastic, right? They used to give us a choice. Would you like paper or plastic? Well, now they just automatically put stuff in plastic. And I'm like, hold on a second. I want my paper bags. I need those. And as a matter of fact, I don't just use them for scrap papers to paint. Sometimes I actually use them as my substrate. And so some of you know what a substrate is. If you're new to art or mixed media, a substrate just is basically a fancy word for the surface that you create on. It's your foundation. And I use multiple things. When we do mixed media, part of the beauty and joy of mixed media is, hey, no rules no need for fancy stuff. You know, if you're a fine artist, you want a canvas that's been gessoed and prepared and you just want your paints to glide and all that stuff. With mixed media, doesn't matter. Do it on a scrap piece of wood. Use a cereal box, a large cereal box cut to the size that you want it to be, an 8x10. I can even get a 9x12 at a large, out of a large box of Cheerios. <laughs> and that's a great surface to work on because it's nice and sturdy. It holds that adhesive and um, it's just nice to work on. For this particular project, I used, this is the back of a pad of paper. So you might recognize this part. So when you have a pad of paper, you know, usually they come in an eight and a half by 11. This one is a nine by 12 because this was the, um, the back of the pad for the paper that I typically work on if I'm gonna be doing a project, um, if I'm gonna use paper. This is canvas paper. So that's what the back pad came from. The chipboard came off of this. I've taken it off. But this is canvas paper. I'm just going to give you a close up. It's really hard to see on camera, but it has a little texture to it. It's a little heavier than cardstock. The texture, I think, just takes the adhesive a little better and it just holds things a little, a little better without getting too thick. So I just wanted to show you that. And this is another piece of chipboard that hasn't been worked on. This came off of another pad of paper. I hoard these. I hoard these. These are such nice surfaces for mixed media. Okay, so we got, oh, we're going to actually work on that one. And then I just have a reminder. I did do some templates for you if you so choose. And I'm going to be using my favorite, personal favorite adhesive. And gosh, do I get a lot of questions about this. This is called gel medium. Okay. Matte Gel. This one happens to be by Liquitex. I don't really have a brand preference, but this is the one that I have now because it's large and I got it on sale. So this is what it looks like. And can you use regular glue? Absolutely. Can you use Mod Podge? Absolutely. I do prefer a matte finish, but that's your choice. You know, no rules. Again, no rules. This has its consistency. This is a gel. So you may see Liquitex have something called um, matte medium, but it's missing the word gel. And so it's more fluid like a glue. It'll still work, but I really, really like this consistency because I can control it. And I like to use it with my palette knife because I can control it and I can't, don't have to use as much. So we're gonna be making a collage on here. Now, let me talk a little bit about collage. For me, some people, and sometimes even I, just slap down some papers on a background and just make a collage and just love the patchwork look and don't have a specific plan in mind, and that is gorgeous. I love that type of collage. It's a great mindless way to be creative. And then there are times when I do a project, for instance, this one, where I kind of just think, even though a lot of it's going to get covered, I enjoy the process of selecting papers for my collage that maybe relate to what I'm making. So in this case, pumpkins, fall, farm, harvest, that kind of thing. So I did use that kind of thing all over my background. A lot of it's covered up. 
but part of the fun, and you if you've watched me for a while and you watched yesterday, you know that part of the fun for me and the thrill actually is the little surprises that happen in mixed media. And so even though you know when you're going in, some of this is gonna be covered up in the end. Don't think about it too much. And in the end, when you're finished, it's really fun to see the stuff that actually is still showing. So in my case, if you look up really close, I had a piece of sheet music, a song that was called, I Wish I Were a Farmer. And so you can just barely see those words coming out. And then you see some of the sheet music and the music notes. I've got person up here. There are words over here. It says, I like the tricks. Well, that's like trick or treat, right? That's fun. And then there are just some other other things here. These are, this is actually a book page. The leaves back here, see the black lines and the branch? That's actually from an old children's coloring book, an antique coloring book. And I thought the vines were gonna look pretty cool in the end and they do. So I'm really, really happy with that. So that's what I mean by telling a story when you're doing mixed media. Do you have to do that? No, but I'm just sharing with you the stuff that I just love about it and that's what I do. So what did I do? I went through my stash. Admittedly, I have a rather large stash of stuff that has to do with paper. Um, the books. So the that I look for when I go thrifting are um, old cookbooks. Looky here, I've got a pumpkin chiffon pie recipe. Got just a little bit of information about pumpkins in this old cookbook. I've got, let's see what else I found. I've got a cat. Doesn't that have remind you a little bit of like fall and Halloween? I've got a dictionary page that says, guess what on it? Pumpkin. So a dictionary page. Here's another recipe page, old fashioned pumpkin pie. Then I've had this little house and fence that I've had cut out that I haven't used, so I grabbed that. This is the other page of the pumpkin the farm song. So it talks about, I wish I had a little farm upon the river bank. I'd meet the bugs in a shooting match in the sweet potato patch and um, cream cheese cow and guinea hens. And so anyway, I just thought that kind of goes with it. So I've got that. And then I've got, this doesn't really go with a theme or anything, but I love the look of the dot to dot, like connect the dots books. And this is an old antique, not antique, it's probably vintage but not super old. And then I've got also some leaves from a connect the dot. So these are just some examples. And then just randomly, I have an old copy of a letter that has this beautiful script. I love using old script. It's crazy, right? That now we kind of are drawn to the old cursive and script because you don't see it that much anymore. And then this is a word search. Guess what? When I flipped through my word search, I found one that was specific to making pies. And so I'll be using some of these letters and perhaps some of these words in my collage. And then I just have some random book pages. I don't, these don't really go with my theme. I don't think I like the color of them. So a little bit of variation in color and a little bit of variation in font. And then I also just have this piece of scrapbook paper that has some numbers on it. I love incorporating numbers different sized numbers, different sized fonts, different kinds of fonts, curly font, block font, typeset font, you know, typewriter font. So all of that stuff, script, handwriting. And so we're just gonna start collaging this together, all right? And what I tell my students and what I tell anybody whenever I'm teaching a class, you kind of put a little bit of thought into it, but when I collage, I kind of just let go and just let it happen. Don't think about it much and just enjoy the process. Right. So, Hi, Debbie. Getting back to the collage and the collage materials, I will call myself a hoarder. I don't have any problem with that. Hoarder has a really negative connotation, but sometimes, you know, we're simply collectors. We are people who, we like what we like. We want to surround ourselves with beautiful things, especially as creatives. We want to have in our stash stuff that's easy to access when we're ready to make something. And so if I get a, an inkling or a inspiration to sit down and make a scarecrow, let's say, I want to have access to those things that will go into my scarecrow project. So did I go out and buy a bunch of stuff that was specific to my pumpkin project? No, I already have a bunch of cookbooks, not a bunch, a few cookbooks, old cookbooks. I already have a couple books of sheet music. I already have a dictionary or two or three. I already have some game books, old coloring books. 
and those kinds of things. Old children's books, little golden books, little junior elf books. I have those collected and I have them on shelves in my craft room. And so anytime I'm thinking of a theme, I can find those, you know, what I need within those pages without feeling like I need to go by just for this project. It's just something to have, you know, around. And you can certainly print things as well. And speaking of which, whenever we have a project, so for instance, if this pumpkin project were a project in my membership group, the girls would get from me a printable collection of my own papers. So I would take scanned copies of what I would be using or what I can legally provide to them without copyright worries and provide to them papers that they can print and they can use, which is a huge benefit also of being in the membership. You don't want to go out, out and find something if you don't want to go buy a dozen books just to get a few pages. I provide that to you every single month, at least one printable collage pack that goes with the theme of whatever we happen to be working on that month. So a huge benefit that sometimes I forget to mention. But um, yeah, so usually like eight to ten pages of really cool images. And just because everybody has the same images doesn't mean their project's going to turn out the same. It's amazing how somebody can take the same eight pages and, you know, 500 people can turn out a totally different background. Pretty fun. Vicki says, when I started collecting books for collage media, I went to garage sales and found great cheap books. Yes, I want to get on with our project, but I just have to tell you, at an estate sale one time, it was an online auction. Okay, I love the online auctions. I love, love, love estate sales. Those are when people just really want to get rid of whatever it is that grandma had. They don't want to mess with it. They have other things to worry about right now. So um, I love those sales because I can go and find things that I'm going to give new life and help somebody else kind of move on. And so one time I bought a lot, they call it a lot, like you buy things in a group, so it's called a lot. So I bought a lot of books and it was literally a lot of books. I didn't realize how many I had purchased and it was only like 20 bucks. And I thought, oh, we'll take a ride. I brought my daughter with me, went to go pick up the books. They, they sent me upstairs in this non-air conditioned house and it was full, the bedroom was full of books. And I said, which stack is mine? And they said, all of them. <laughs> And you're obligated to take them, whatever you buy. So I, my van was literally filled from the floor to the top. I couldn't see out the back window. So on the way home, I donated a bunch of them, went through them. My daughter was helping me. She was just giving them to the donation person <laughs> at the, uh, our local thrift store. And then I kept what I wanted. But that was just a really, really funny story. Okay, so let's get to collaging. And I'll answer questions as we collage. Here's what I do. I tear. I did a different setup today to see if you could see things better. So I just tear. You see, I didn't think about it much. Now, this had color in it. I don't know if I want the color, but that little barn is super cute, isn't it? I might, I might go ahead and keep it. And isn't he cute? I might keep that. Music pages. I don't know where I'm putting it yet. I'm just kind of tearing it, okay? Um, let's go to our pie page. And when I collage, I kind of think of things, you know, you lay it out like kind of like a sandwich or a salad. You've got your big lettuce chunks, then you've got your little veggies, and then you kind of sprinkle it with some cheese. And so <laughs> in my collage, I'm going to go with my big chunks in the back, like those big pictures. And then as I start laying things down and gluing it down, as I come to the foreground, my pieces are going to get smaller and I start to fill in space. So I've got my little old-fashioned pumpkin pie. So the one thing I do think about, I say don't think about it much, but the one thing I do think about is not a whole lot of white space. So see this little piece here? I'm going to actually take that off. I don't want a ton of white space. This little lady here, I really don't have a specific reason that I cut that out. I think it's actually on the back of my recipe. But I kind of like it because it's different and it's quirky and it doesn't make any sense. So sometimes I just, I like that it doesn't make any sense. Um, this, the title up here, Old Fashioned Pumpkin Pie. I'm going to leave that. I've got my dictionary page that says pumpkin on it. I'm going to go ahead and tear that off. And the actual word on the dictionary page, tear that off. So that was the, you know, the top part of the page. And the definition is actually down here. 
I've got my kitty cat. Let's tear around my cat. Now, why am I tearing versus cutting around these papers? Because papers are fibers. They're little fibers. And when you tear the paper, it exposes those little fibers. And what happens when those fibers are exposed, when you glue them together, even though it's two separate pieces of paper, they kind of want to lock together. And so it makes a really smooth, cohesive collage. If you just leave the straight edges or you just cut them, they don't, so then they're like this and they don't really have it's got a different brand of matte gel medium. And I have to say, I want to go back to Liquitex. It is the best. Okay, good to know, Lajeen. Um, Gail says, is it okay if the background papers are different weights? I don't like to do anything much heavier than maybe this sheet music. I really like, well, here's what I will say. If you are consistent, um, keep, if you're going to do paper, keep it paper. If you're going to do cardstock, do cardstock. The only reason I say that is if you go any heavier on one or two pieces, that piece is going to kind of stick up a little bit, maybe a little distracting and maybe a little bit, bit harder to work with. Melanie says it's therapeutic. Absolutely. Collage is therapeutic. Thank you, Melanie. Sometimes I will simply sit down with leftover scraps, right? So I, I will work with something, cutting maybe my old scrapbook papers that are beautifully patterned, magazine pages, junk mail, you know, something pretty from a catalog, anything. And I will simply make a huge, what I call a master board collage. And those can be used as backgrounds for future uh, projects, or they can be used in my journals where I create little embellishments to go in my journals. And that's a whole other time to talk about junk journaling. All right. Loretta says, it is real hard to find my area. I ended up with Golden. Golden is a brand. She's talking about a golden brand of matte gel medium. Good to know. Okay, so those, I think, and if I use this little house, that's going to probably fill it up pretty good. And here's the truth. The house is probably not going to make it to the end of my project unless I bring it kind of over here, in which case I'm going to tear it off. And then look, I'm going to clean off my surface now. I've kind of got my pieces going, and I'm just going to start gluing them down. Now, what I do when I collage, so... Here is my matte gel medium on my palette knife. I just got a little on there. Looks like I'm buttering my toast or making a peanut butter sandwich, except I don't want a lot of peanut butter. I just want a small, thin coat. And as I'm putting it on, I'm scraping it off. So it just doesn't take that much. I just got a breeze and all my papers are blowing. Ah, no, not my kitty cat. It's beautiful out here today. Beautiful breeze. It feels so good. All right, so I'm going to put that on. Now look, I went over the edge, over the edge of my, I call it a canvas. It's not a canvas. I say canvas in a generic term, like my surface. I'm going over the edge. Look, making pies. I'm going to put that right up there at the top because I'm pretty sure, like I say, don't think about it, but mm, I'm going to wait for that. I kind of want that to show. My edge, I know, is going to be kind of dark, so um, trying to find something else. How about just a basic book page? And I'm going over the edge, and you'll see why when we get this all collaged. So you can see I don't mind the variation in color. We're going to be applying uh, a color finish to this background anyway. Now there's my making pies, and I think that's going to show up when I'm finished. And you'll see what I mean. And then I've got this. I like to go in with some bigger pieces and really start filling it in. If you're too small and it just takes forever and a lot of stuff ends up getting covered up that you wanted to save. So go in big. I'm going to keep this up here still over the edge. Honey pumpkin on this page. And we'll go down here with that. I do have a straight edge here that I'm not crazy about, but I'm going to end up covering that anyway. Um, 
let's go with our handwritten letter. I'm going to tear the edges of that. Sometimes in collage, I do choose a straight edge. It just depends on what I'm doing. If you were in the bicycle class, you know, and I'm wearing gloves. A lot of people ask me, why are you wearing gloves? You're seeing exactly why I wear gloves sometimes, especially when I'm collaging. I like to run my hands over it. I'm pushing down some bubbles, pushing down some wrinkles, and I just don't like when the glue dries on my hands. I can't feel what I'm doing after it's dry on my hands, and it's just really hard to get off. I just don't like it. So using my gloves, it just gives me the freedom to just push my hands in it and not worry about it. I've got this little lady. Whoops, sorry about that. I've got this little lady I'm going to put on here. We don't know exactly what she's all about. We're going to stick her up here anyway. Doesn't have to make sense. We've got our dot to dot. So sometimes your story may be a little more personal than others. Um, when we did the bicycle class and the clothesline class, there were people who had a very, very specific personal connection to what was going on in their picture. Some people were, were silly about it. It doesn't, you know, it's your personal choice. You don't have to have anything that has to do with pumpkin in your background. What I'm here to do is just share with you the joy that I get and why, and then your art journey is your art journey. I'm going to go for my old-fashioned pumpkin pie now because I can see that it's going to fit right there just perfectly. Do you have to have a palette knife to use adhesive? No. Nobody's asked me that, but I know it's going to come. Is it necessary to go over the top with gel medium? What I'm doing when I'm going over the top like this is I'm not necessarily putting the glue on as much as I am smoothing out my paper. Um, I've got this little bare spot here, so that's a great use for my little letters from the word search. You see how I can just put them sideways or crooked or whatever I want to do. I like that. And we're starting to get smaller spaces now, a little easier to fill these in now. And you see I went over the edge all the way around. It looks really messy now. Trust the process. Trust the process. I think I'm going to use, no, I'm not going to use the little barn. I might use it for something else sometime, though. Oh, um, actually, my dictionary page said pumpkin on one side, but pumpkin seed on the other. And I think I'm going to leave that here and hope that shows up when I'm finished. If it doesn't, that's okay. I'm still telling the story. Okay. Um, what else? Just have a little tiny space here on the edge. So I'm just going to take a few little letters. These little num numbers and letters just come in handy just to fill in space or little book pages or whatever. I've got my kitty cat. Make it, make it covered, but. And I've got my little house. You can see a lot of stuff's getting covered up. And in the end, you may see right here, my pumpkins are going to be right here. Is my house going to show? Probably not. But you know what? you got to have something back there. It might as well be something that we're not totally sold on. And then, let's see, I've got a little piece that says pumpkin chiffon pie. Put a little adhesive on there. Probably going to get covered up. It's okay. And another little recipe piece. And that covers up my surface. So that is the collage. Now what I do next is trim around it. Those of you who have <laughs> worked with me a while, you know that this little silly step 
is one of my favorite steps <laughs> in mixed media. I know, I, I know, I just love to collage to simply do this part. Isn't that funny? Sometimes I will just sit down and do collage to relax, like I said earlier, and then I, I do that just so I can do this part. And this part is trimming off the edge. Me too. I love the no sound of crinkling paper. I love the sound of scraping the palette knife. It's there. <laughs> We're getting all all five senses going here. The sound of it, the look of it, the scent of the paints and the papers. And let's face it, I don't know if you're like me, but I love the smell of an old book. If I open an old book or any book, like a school book, you know what I'm talking about? And you open it and smell that. And then um, what else? What else? What other senses am I missing? Oh, taste. Yeah, don't eat anything. Don't eat anything. Although I do tend to have a good snack and a good beverage when I am creating. So yeah, we get all the all five senses taken care of. All right, so what I do is I just flip it over and trim around. This is much easier to do if you let it dry a little bit. Cutting paper that is soaked with adhesive is very difficult. Somewhat difficult, it's not very difficult. And I, and I don't turn it over until I'm totally finished. I like to turn it over all at once. And the big reveal. There is our collage with all the edges trimmed off. So the reason I go over the edge is because when you trim it, it just gives it that nice finished look on the edge. I'm going to go up just a little bit. So we'll see we got that nice finished look on the edge. Isn't that nice? And anything that's just a little bit, I didn't get it because it was wet. Some of it didn't trim perfectly. I can just take and wrap it around the back. Smooth out the edges. And that's our collage. So we've got pumpkin, we've got cat, we've got the little house, we've got some sheet music, some word search, making pies, some farm sheet music, the pumpkin seed, dictionary page, pumpkin recipe ingredients and directions, the little farmhouse. So it is magic. Collage is magic. It's so wonderful because there's a lot of stuff that goes into collaging for me. It's the hunt for just the right thing to tell the story or go with my theme. It's the tearing of the papers, applying the papers, the process of collaging. Like somebody said, it's therapeutic. It's so relaxing. It's like meditative. And it's the reveal. It's so much fun to see. It's like, it is artistic to put that together to tell a story. And you're reusing, you're repurposing. And I love that. I love taking something older that was discarded or maybe was not going to be read or used again or it's falling apart and giving it new life in a new way. Thank you, Terry. Amy says, I like the word search. Gives me another idea. Crosswords look great in a collage. Crosswords with the open squares and the closed squares, even some that you find that are already filled in. The little handwritten parts of it. Love it. Love it. Um, my coloring book, my antique vintage coloring book that I have that I use a lot, the cat came from. Um, some of it's colored in by a, by a child, and I've used that before. And um, so all of it, all of it works just depending on what you're doing. Um, somebody must have asked what I'm working on. I'm working on the chipboard from a pad of paper. You're absolutely right, Suzanne. So that is the actual collaged background. And now we are going to just kind of straighten this out a little bit. We're going to start painting it a little bit. So let's just look at our finished product. Can you believe that the back of a pad of paper, nine inch by 12 inch, by the way, that's the size that I've made the templates to go with a nine inch by 12 inch substrate. So can you believe that we use the back of a pad of paper, some brown paper, scrap, grocery bags or packing material to create our pumpkin sections. We haven't created them yet, but we've painted them. And now we have just taken some stuff from old books. You can use maps. You can use junk mail, you can use magazines, catalogs, cookbooks, you name it. And we have collaged something that is meaningful and super fun. And so next I'm going to create that really pretty color that's in the background. And to do that, and you don't have to have what I'm using, 
Now, every time I use something that's a little bit fancier, I always say there are alternatives. So I'm going to use alcohol ink today. These are by Ranger. I really like to use them because they are so transparent and they run all over the place and you can see through them. I said they're transparent. Obviously, that's the same thing. And you can just play with them so they don't dry right away. And um, they're just really fun. And the, the colors are super vibrant. So this is alcohol ink. If you don't have alcohol ink, use your basic acrylic paints, but water them down. Same thing. The color might not be quite as vivid, but you can still do this and make it transparent. Now, this is a little risky to go right onto it. You've got to be ready, okay, because you'll get dots. But I'm going to go right onto my canvas with my alcohol ink, and I'm going to start immediately just smushing it. Did you see that? That was like one drop. And I'm smushing it all over. Just have It does have a really strong odor, by the way. I could even just put it on my brush, dip my brush in some water, and just smush that around. The more I put on here, the more vivid it's going to get. But I'm going to do it in layers and just make sure I don't go on too dark at first. And how much you use, totally your choice. Do you want it super vivid? Do you want it to be light? Do you want to use a totally different color? This color, by the way, ooh, I'm not even sure. I don't know where the name of the color is. Stream. I think it's called Stream. So as it starts to dry just a little bit, it's starting to get a little bit darker. So layering on top of the color before. So what's fun is that it brings my collage together. All of those pieces now make sense all together. They're all one color, but they came from different places. And they now are just one big happy collage family. You can also use watercolor for this. You're just going to want not a ton of water in your watercolor. Make it nice and vivid, smush it around. See how it's getting bluer and bluer the more the more I add layers to it. It's really vivid to me in person, but it's not super vivid on the camera. But so I'm going to go in, boom, 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 boom. Really, this part right in here is where we're going to get be able to see a lot of what's going on. And you could even I wish I had a baby wipe here with a wet baby wipe. So I've got a lot of brush strokes. I think they'll settle in when this starts to dry, but I'm not a big fan of brush strokes. I really like for things to look more messy, I guess, messy, organic, unstructured. And um, so I am going to go in and just kind of mess up my brush strokes. Heck, I can even go in with my hand. And I'm just kind of smushing it. So do you see what I did? I don't know if you can see that detail. But I just took those brush strokes out, and now it just has a more smushiness. A little bit. I like while it's a little bit wet. It's starting to curl on me, by the way. Let's take a moment. See how that's curving? Let's take a moment and talk about that. I know that that's a common question that I get. People are really bothered by this. Why is it curving? How do I prevent that from happening? Okay, I have a I have an answer. For one of those questions, it's curving because mm, I'm going to put some more on there. It's curving because of the moisture. The moisture is making the uh, paper kind of constrict, and so that's pulling, pulling it. It's wanting to constrict and pull. I have heard, but I haven't tried it that you can spray the back. So I'm gonna do that right now. Spray the back of whatever you're working on. I've got a spray bottle. And I'm gonna spray the back of it. And so it's kind of like counteracting the dry with the wet. It's allowing it all to kind of be, to be wet. And we're gonna see, I should have done it before we started the collage, but we're gonna see if that helps. 
keep things flat. Lisa says, could you smush with a sponge or a cotton ball? These are the questions that I love. I love when somebody says, sorry, I'm moving this. I love when somebody says, could I do this? Can you use such and such? The answer is always yes. I would say most of the time, yes. That's the joy of mixed media, breaking those boundaries, going against what we might perceive as a rule, breaking the boundaries between a paintbrush and your hands or a sponge or a cotton ball, or go step on it with your feet, with your shoes, go make a pattern with the bottom of your shoes, go use a comb and take a comb through it. You know, there are no boundaries, there are no rules, and the opportunities are endless to play and experiment. And because the materials that we use are so abundant, then we never feel guilty about wasting anything. And what we use is not super expensive, so we never feel guilty about wasting anything. Um, Lynn says, I have some scrapbook paper that I don't like, so I'm going to use them when my gel plate arrives. Exactly, Lynn. And Lynn's one that was emailing me. We were talking about gel plates, and she was asking what size I had and what brand and everything. And I told her one of the reasons I have a 12 by 12 is because being a former scrapbooker, I have a ton of scrapbook paper from pads um, where some of the pages I liked and some of them I didn't, but I still have them for some unknown reason. I'm a paper hoarder, that's why. And so with my 12 by 12 gel plate, I can use those papers either on the front on the pattern that I don't like or use the back and make new paper. and Give it new life, repurposing and reusing, right? So I wanted to have a little bit of fun with this. This is just a putty knife. You can see I've had quite a bit of fun with it. It's still got stuff on it, which I don't mind. And I'm going to take this antiquing cream. This is from Deco Art. It doesn't have to be this antiquing cream. You could even just use a brown paint. You could use, if you have a distress paint in your collection, um, you know, whether you just done some furniture or something like that, like a glaze, like an antiquing glaze, anything like that. So I'm going to use this antiquing cream and I'm going to go across the top of my collage. Look at that. What the heck is she doing? They're saying, what in the heck is she doing? And look, now I'm going to take my putty knife and I'm going to scrape it. I don't know what I'm doing, honestly. What am I doing? I don't know. Who cares? I'm playing. And I'm going to do that and I'm going to scrape some down here. And this is antiquing cream, so it's not an opaque paint, okay? And if I had a baby wipe, I wish I had brought baby wipes with me today. Baby wipes come in so handy. Oh, it's still kind of wet. Mm, I wish I had a towel or a baby wipe, but I'll use my hands. So I'm going to smush some of it off. Look. <laughs> You don't have to scrape it on. But you see how it's just kind of getting that little shadowy look around the edge? And then, mm, oh, you know what? I've got these makeup wedges. I'm going to use that as my little, like a dabber. Like this is what I would use a baby wipe for, just to kind of dab it away. Because I don't want it to be perfect. Straight across. Did my phone stop? No, we're going now. Okay. I don't want it to be perfectly straight across the top. So I'm just dabbing to make it really uneven. And you guys, is anybody panicking saying, oh God, she's just covering up all that beautiful blue and everything. This is, this is how we got to the final result. So you got to trust me. Okay, I've got my Deco Art Dazzling Metallics. I thought with these pumpkins and this kind of turquoise color, wouldn't gold look really cool? So I toyed with the idea of gold leaf, like a little bit of gold leaf just here and there. And I still think that would be really, really pretty, but I couldn't find it. I couldn't find my gold leaf. So I went to my gold paint instead. And I'm going to use, where's that makeup wedge I just had? My space isn't that big. How can I lose my makeup wedge? Anybody see? Oh, there it is right in front of my face. All right. 
So I'm using this same stamp that we used yesterday on our papers. And I'm just going to dab some of my gold metallic paint. Here it is. I don't, I'm not worried about a complete coverage. I'm not going to freak out if it globs, whatever. And I'm just going to push that down somewhere, anywhere. And you can see it, it didn't give good coverage. That's fine. I love that. Right? The beauty is in the imperfection. And we're just going to get, you can barely see, I'll bring you, I'll give you a close up in just a second. I'm going to go on a little bit heavier. And some of this is going to fall behind the pumpkins. That's okay. I'm still putting it in because I'm not sure exactly where. My table is giving on me here in the middle. So I'm going to lift my canvas up so I can get, there you go. See the gold? The little gold scrolly scrollies, right? Pretty, pretty, pretty. I love that. Let's look at our curl. We do have less curl by spraying the back. We may have found a solution to the curling of our substrate. Would that be awesome? We'll have to try it a few times just to be sure. Make sure it's not just luck. I'm going to go over here. Oh, I like that. That turned out good. Vivid and imperfect. So I'm focusing on the edges because I know that's what's going to end up showing in the end. Even though I say don't plan too much, just go for it. And also by adding another layer of something, whether it's a stencil or if it's a stamp, just by adding another layer of something, you continue to build depth. So if you look, we'll just take a little close up look. If you look, the more you add, so we started with the paper, then we went with the dark edging, or no, we started with the paper, we went with the blue paint, then the dark edging, and now the gold stamp. So you just see how there's depth. You actually look like you're looking into depth. Right. So there it is with now with that distressor ink around the edge coming together. Right. Looking really good. Let's see what's still showing in our collage. Pumpkin seed. Two tablespoons. Old fashioned pumpkin pie. Baking pies. Pumpkin word pumpkin. Look at that. We can barely see it up here. Isn't that cool? Isn't it cool how it's. It's really subtle. It's still back there. This says pumpkin. We can just barely see this little pumpkin here that's been sliced. Look at that. Right? You saw me do this. I wasn't planning like every little thing. It just happens. And look, the word October here did not plan that. Pumpkins. The little cat. Right? Just amazing. And every single time you do this, every single time, it's new. It's a new adventure, a new experience. The stems. We haven't talked about the stems, but the stems were the exact same process as the pumpkin sections. I just didn't show you the brown color. So it's the same exact thing. I'll give you a close up really quick just to inspire you and show you kind of how mine turned out close up. I used burnt umber, probably a little bit of yellow ochre, maybe some green, that Hauser light green that I like. And, you know, use my gel press or just smush some paints around. And that's how I made my stems. Also using the brown paper, just like we've been doing. So just a reminder, this is where we're going. This is where we're heading with all of these different tips and tricks this week. We hope to land here by the end of the week? Or have you armed with a bunch of new skills and confidence that you can make something similar? It doesn't have to be pumpkins, it can be anything. Second, But here is the template. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut each of these individual sections, it's gonna take a little bit, but we're gonna end up covering them with the papers of our choice after mounting them onto like a cardstock. Do you have to mount them on cardstock? 
can you simply just trace your sections onto your colored papers? Sure. But I kind of like dimension that it provides that you might not be able to pick up on camera. Can you see? Oh, I don't know if you can. Maybe you can. But there's a little bit of dimension. They kind of just stick out a little bit from the canvas. And so because I mounted my colored papers onto cardstock, it gives it that dimension. It did just kind of stand up a little bit off the off the paper. Sherry, thank you. She says the templates are on the Artists Unlimited page. Are the first two classes available? Asks Lisa. Yes. Just scroll through my videos here on this page. Um, and when I say this page, in case you're watching it on replay that's been shared someone else, when I say somewhere else, when I say this page, I mean Artists Unlimited Facebook page. It's a public page anybody can watch. Okay. So what I'm going to do first is cut out my sections. I know that doesn't sound very exciting, does it? But um, while I do that, I thought um, you could ask any questions about anything that we've done so far. And I'm just going to bring it over here. And I am going to cut these out along the lines. front of my pieces, glue that to the paper that I want that section to be. Now you'll see I didn't really like plan like what part of the section. I like the surprise of it. So I'm going to put that one aside and then I'm working on the big pumpkin which I'm trying to keep mostly orange. So I've got this piece here. I do like these darker colors here. I love, love, love this piece. I think I'll use it for two of my sections. Right side down color on the right side. So I'm just going to start cutting these pieces out now. So the reason we put them right side down and we cut them out before hand is so that we can cut directly around the edges of our sections. I think my pieces went together a little differently than the other one, but it's okay. I'm getting this really fat bottom pumpkin. I don't know. Does it look different or does it look the same? Is it the same? It's pretty similar. Isn't that cute? Look at it. Look at it. Look at all the sections and all that that we did that seemed so silly. Like, oh my gosh, you're just like painting some brown paper. But look at the effect. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, so now we kind of got a gauge 
where this other pumpkin's going to go. And we've got this center one. And if you look, it's subtle. But do you see how the smaller pumpkin is slightly lower than the large pumpkin? What does that do? It makes it look like the little pumpkin is a little bit in front of the big pumpkin, right? So it adds to that dimension. But we're going to make that little pumpkin just a little bit lower. Something to keep in mind when you put your big, big pumpkin on. Leave enough space below it so you can put the small pumpkin just a little bit lower. And if you forget, it's not the end of the world. I'm going to cock it over to the right a little bit. And then my wider pieces, so round, rounder at the top, pointed at the bottom. Everybody here okay? Everything look okay so, still? And again, if I have a little gap, I'm okay with that. Because, oh boy, oh boy, we're going to get to the outlining in just a minute. Uh, Shanna, me too. That bottom pumpkins make the rockin' world go round, right? Um, tootie duty duty. Where does this piece go? It goes here. And hey, this is that piece that simply had like some, it's still a brown piece, but it had. Mm, that is not fitting, y'all. What did I do wrong? There we go. So this is the piece that had the uh, just the brown paint on there, and there's still a lot of brown paper raw there. Oh, no, I'm missing a piece. There it is. Pretty sure I put this together a little wonky. It looks more like a gourd. I'm just going to compare. Hold on. So I can still move it if I want. I'm going to, forgive me, but I want it right. I want you to learn. I think these two are switched. Anybody else think so? I like that better. Yeah, I like that better. And see, you can see gaps in between the pieces, but that's okay. It's going to come together. I'm going to move my stem a little bit. So I'm just playing here. Okay, so this is my beloved Stabilo All pencil. It's a graphite pencil. Looks like this. So is that in focus? I just want you to be able to see what it's called. Stabilo all number number eight zero four six i get mine on amazon it's graphite but the color is black and this is a great way to outline the reason i like it it's just a little looser and a little smudgier and 
more fun to use than like a Sharpie. You can certainly do a Sharpie or paint if that's all you have. But the Stabilo just allows you to kind of be messy. And it just provides more of an organic, shadowy look. Smoky. Smoky, shadowy. So what I'm doing is I'm going along and just like loosely drawing an outline. I'm letting my pencil hit the canvas. And I'm also letting it hit the edges of my pumpkin sections. And it's okay because it's all going to blend together in a minute. You can al already kind of see how this is working. So I'm going to take gonna a little paintbrush with a smidge of water. And when I go along my Stabilo pencil marks, it just kind of smudges that all together in the most beautiful way and adds just this really natural shadowy look between our sections. Mm, 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 mm. So much fun. So satisfying. See what happened? Ooh. Ah. Gorgeous, right? And I'm not being perfect. You know, it's kind of jumping off the edge of my sections onto the canvas underneath. I've still got adhesive that my pencil's kind of going through. So when I'm wipe when I'm pulling this away and taking it between my fingers, I'm actually wiping off the excess of adhesive that's between the sections. Cleaning off the tip of the pencil so I can go back. Stay inspired. So at some point, guys, I got something on my face. Look at me. I look like somebody's punched me in the lip. This is hilarious. What is that? Why didn't somebody tell me I have paint on my lip? That looks hysterical. Um, that is so funny. Yesterday, I had green paint on my cheek after we were finished. And I went around all day. And finally, my oldest daughter was like, you do know that you have green paint on your face, right? Isn't that fun? Can you believe that we took a scrap chipboard to the back of a pad, scrap brown paper from packaging, just a small amount of paint, a scrap piece of a cover of a pad, some stamps, some inks, and made this. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. It is amazing. And there's still more that we can do, like small details, and we'll do that tomorrow. I think I got it, most of it anyway. <laughs> what the heck? Oh. Uh, so today we're going to add those final details. It's going to bring it all together. And then I am going to talk to you about how to add a finishing layer. So like a spray or... Um, another type of finishing product. And I'm going to tell you about that when we finish the details. I get a lot of questions on, so how do you protect your art? What do you do to it in the end? Do you spray it with something? Do you coat it with something? Do you use a varnish? And so I'm going to talk about a few different options when we finish up our details. You are welcome to email me your finished piece, jennifer at themakerbeehive.com. I would love to see it. And you are also welcome to go into my free Facebook group where you're able to share your art. And you can search that on Facebook by putting in your search bar, mixed media and paper crafting with Jennifer Chamberlain. Find that group and just, um, request to join and I will get you in okay when it says there's a question it'll ask you have you taken any classes with Jennifer and although this isn't an actual class just say the pumpkin festival and I will know to let you in so what we're gonna do now is just add those final details so I'm gonna start with my sharpie so if you wanted to and of course you don't have to do any of these things these are just fun suggestions you know how a pumpkin has some of those curly Q little vines that come off so you could just draw those in with a sharpie and see how that just adds a little bit of whimsy and fun just a couple and we could do one over here with just one little curly Q 
and then maybe one coming off over here and even maybe off the tip of the stem. Sometimes we have those straggly little pieces that come off the end of the stem, right? So just, you know, don't overdo it, just a, just a couple. And um, so that's just with the Sharpie. So easy breezy lemon squeezy. And then I am going to start working on a little bit down here. This is totally optional. I could totally leave this and be fine with it. I, I feel like it's got a nice foundation. We've got some good shadowing going on under here. It doesn't look like they're just floating in midair, but I'm just wanted to show you a couple little things you could do. Okay, so what I have over here are a few paints that I'm going to incorporate it into some leaf design at the bottom as if my pumpkins are just sitting in the patch on some leaves. And I am using Antique Gold Hauser Light Green is this one. I love, 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 love this color. These are like some of my favorite colors here. These are all Deco Art, by the way, Deco Art Americana. And then this one is antique green. Aren't they gorgeous together? And I think they look really good with this project. I'm also using, this is just like a little sponge tool. You don't have to have this. I just happened to see it in my stash. I've had it for a long time. And it also came from Deco Art. It's called a pouncer. And one side is one inch and this side is one and an eighth inch. Don't necessarily need this. You can use a piece of a sponge. You can use a stencil brush. You can use a makeup sponge, whatever. So I also have some little stamps and these are just little inexpensive stamps. They're probably intended for kids um, or scrapbooking or something like that. And you can see that they are leaf stamps. If you have a Cricut or some type of die cut machine, you can just use your Cricut to cut out of some cardstock and use that as kind of a disposable stencil and do the same thing. Or you can freehand it. So I think I'm going to start with some larger leaves kind of as a foundation and then I'll build upon that. And I'm going to use this larger leaf here and I'm going to go in with my little dabber and I'm picking up all three of these colors on there and just kind of dabbing that off. I don't want a lot of paint. By the way, my palette is masking tape. So I'm working on a piece of fabric. Um, I really don't want to get this fabric messy, but doesn't it look really cute behind our project? So I just had to use it. I don't want it to get super messy. And I often use masking tape as my palette. So I just took it off of my roll, taped it to my uh, drop cloth or whatever surface you're working on. Makes a great palette. And when you're finished, you just peel the paint away and throw it away. Um, Marcia says, I love stencils. Me too, because you can still be artsy, but not feel that pressure of having to be absolutely perfect. And I love that even with a stencil, you can be imperfect. So I'm going to lay that down nice and firm, and I'm just going to dab those mixed colors onto the bottom of my pumpkin. I'm overlapping the bottom of the pumpkin a little bit, and we're just going to start putting in little leaves and I'm gonna go a little bit darker and just change it up so they look like there's little layers I'm gonna come in with some outlining too later so and again I'm not super concerned about it being a perfect impression just kind of getting that color down there and a general shape. And I can pick a couple of different leaves or I can even take it halfway so that it appears that the leaf is kind of only halfway there. Don't even have to make them go all the way across. You see, I just kind of have it just a few. Just do a few at a time, figure out what you want to do. I think I like that. I might, so I have this other design, and I might just do a little fine leaf 
a little darker and have that kind of going growing up like a vine. So just play with your stencils. Can you see that pretty good? And flip them in different directions. Noting the color, if you're layering, just note the color that was underneath and try to make it different. Does that look good? That's looking good. I like it. I like it. And then another one over here. I like having that gold in there. You could even incorporate a little bit of brown. I didn't bring the brown to my table, but you can incorporate a little bit of brown because some of it's going to. Um, when you're actually having pumpkins out in the patch, some of the growth is kind of brown and dying, right? Somebody said, if we don't have stencils, I'm thinking you could just sketch, absolutely. Or you could make them with paper, just like we did with the pumpkins. Just make yourself some little leaves out of paper, you know, paint your papers in the color of leaves that you want and paste those on just like you did the pumpkin uh, wedges. So that's pretty decent variation in color. I like that. And it looks kind of unfinished because, well, it is unfinished. We're not quite finished yet. So I'm going to zap it with my dryer really quick. So guess what I'm gonna grab next? Cause we need to add some outlining to those leaves, make them pop. So I'm gonna grab my Stabilo and I want it to be nice and sharp. So I sharpened it really well before we started. And this doesn't have to be perfect. I could use my template just to give myself an idea. And just take my Stabilo around And I could even add some veins. You see that? And then the same thing here. So the stencil just kind of helped us with a little bit of shape. Just a little head start, you know? Sometimes we just need a little head start. I think of it like training wheels. Nothing wrong with starting with training wheels when you want to learn to ride a bike. Nothing wrong with using a stencil if you need to just get a little bit of help get, get going on your art. And I've been doing this, this a long time and I still like to use a stencil. This is my Stabilo All Graphite Pencil in black. So that's the Stabilo outline. So you can see it coming together. Doesn't that look good? Well, at least I think it does. <laughs> I'm going to grab a small brush and I'm going to activate that Stabilo and just kind of let it smush and smudge. So just dip in my brush in a little bit of water and just kind of gently, not too much water because it'll pool and really be too too wet and it'll puddle and you'll lose that outline. So just a small amount of water, just damp, barely damp. That's just gonna activate it and allow it to really become part of what you outlined. It just kind of all blends together into one. It's a beautiful effect, I love it. So has everybody been having fun this week with the Pumpkin Fall Fest, Mixed Media Fest? What do you think? Have you learned something new? I 
I figure if I am going to be talking about the membership all week and, you know, open enrollment, you kind of get maybe tired of hearing about it after a while. So at least make it fun, right? And at least let everybody learn something, even if you don't decide to join us. So here is where we are. Looks pretty good. <clears throat> Since the Stabilo is water soluble, do you seal it? Uh, sometimes. I'm not great at sealing my art, but today we're going to do that. Then that look good? So I'm going to go back to my Sharpie, actually. Where did I put it? No worries, I have about 10. Okay, I'm going to go back to my Sharpie, and I'm going to add some of those curly little tendrils on my leaves, too, here and there. So I'm just going to bring one kind of around down here, maybe coming off here. Not too many, I don't want to overdo it. So, pretty good. I'm liking it. And I'm gonna get a stiff dry brush. This can be a stencil brush or any kind of just small brush that doesn't have super flexible bristles. You want it to be fairly stiff with just a tiny amount of paint on it. And I'm just gonna do some slight whispering against my leaves, just to give a little highlight, just barely. See what I did on that leaf? Just barely. It just gives it a little more depth and texture. Most of my paint, I wipe it off. I don't want a big glob. I'm barely touching it. I'm almost like, oh, I don't wanna touch it, but I did. And we can even play around a little bit with doing the same technique where the light might hit the roundness of our pumpkin. Do you see that just a little bit? Totally optional, don't have to. See that? Barely kissing it. Just barely, barely, just grazing the surface. Really, really dry brush. And I'm putting it where the pumpkin would be the roundest, so it's catching the light. And I barely have any paint left on here, which is good. See that? I'm loving it. Now, if the white white bothers you, you can take your Distress ink with a slight amount, just a slight, slight amount, and just tone down the white. Now, you're still going to have the highlight but it's just not gonna be as white. I'm barely, barely using any. I'm just taking away that stark white, but leaving my highlight. Right? Yeah, I'm loving it. Really this is my Burnt Umber. This is an al also another go-to paint that I love. You know that it is because I'm almost out. <laughs> I'm gonna have to dig some out. I just got a shipment of paint too and I'm pretty sure I did not order Burnt Umber. And I have a little Antique White. Again, one of my favorites. All right, so I'm gonna take my palette knife which I just had, here it is. And I'm just gonna take this straight edge right here, okay. the side of my palette knife, little burnt umber, little bit of my antique white, 
and I'm just going to drag the side of my palette knife with those two colors just kind of random but but not I'm kind of curving it and curling it as if we've got some type of brown or dead grass down here. I'm picking up some of my antique gold, putting a little of that there too. Barely any on my palette knife. Just when I drag it through, I get these kind of like straw. It looks like straw. Dead grass or straw. that I like that I feel like it makes a little more sense what do you think I'm liking that. So I think I'm finished with my paint. I'm gonna pull this off. This is what I do with my palette. All three of my pieces of tape that are taped together. I'm just gonna pull that off, put that away. And that is our finished piece. So now I'm gonna talk about how to seal your project. So one thing you need to ask yourself before you seal your project is do you like a matte finish with no shine? Or do you like a shiny finish? And for me, sometimes it depends on what I'm doing. Uh, you know, the vibe that I'm going for, or, you know, it just depends. I think you just kind of get a gut feeling. Do I want this to be a matte finish or do I want it to be a shiny finish? Is I'm going to pull over this cookie sheet, my really cruddy cookie sheet that I use for messy, messy work. And you can see that I've got some glue here. I was playing with something else that has nothing to do with this project, so just ignore that. But I've got a cup here in the middle and I'm going to sit my project on top of this cup, okay? And we're going to we're going to coat this one with something in a minute. But at first I'm going to go through some options that I have used that you could do. So this is a matte sealer. This is a spray. And all this does is really protect everything and keep it from smearing. Um just it's just a protective coat and it keeps it matte. I like this one because I've never had any yellowing or any issues with coverage. It works out really well. So this is a good one. It's called Painter's Touch Rust-Oleum Matte Clear. Um, I have also used this, although when I'm showing you this, this can is much more full than my Rust-Oleum, which means I probably go to my, or this is Rust-Oleum also, but I probably go to this one more than I do this one because I like it so much. This is not a lot left. There's a ton left in this one because I choose this one first, but I like them both. They both give you a matte finish. Um, so I'm also going to show you something, and I've already completed our first version with it. So look, this is if you use a gloss. Take a look at that. I went ahead last night and coated this one for you so it would be dry for you to see today. But do you see how pretty that is with the gloss? Now this is a project that I would consider the gloss and I like the gloss so it's up to you what do you think doesn't that look good look at the gold stencil it just makes it makes things a little bit more vivid so the collage the pumpkin details okay and I'm gonna show you how I did that 
this is actually a new product for me. I've only used it a couple of times. And this is, and remember, I'm not affiliated with these projects, with these products. I'm seriously just showing you this based on my experience and what I recommend or don't recommend. So this is Liquitex Professional Acrylic Medium High Gloss Varnish. Okay. What the label says is non-removable, archival, high gloss for acrylics, permanent. All right. And you pour it. Here's the first thing I'm going to tell you. Don't shake it. <laughs> if you shake it, you're going to get bubbles in your project. Ask me how I know. <laughs> and if you get project, you can, if you get bubbles, you can, you can get rid of them, but it's tedious and not necessary. So what you can do is just kind of swirl it if you want, you know, just kind of swirl it before you start. Or if you put it in a separate cup to work with, you can stir it with a popsicle stick or a plastic knife or something like that. So I'm just kind of swirling it like this, making sure everything's nice and mixed, but I'm not going to shake it. I don't want bubbles. So to do this piece probably would take about a third of this bottle. Okay. I don't remember how much it was. One thing I'm going to make sure of is that everything is bent downwards. I'm just giving a little bend. If it's, if you've gotten some curl to your can, uh, canvas or your substrate, you want to make sure it's at least not curling in because then your liquid is going to pull in the middle. So if you've gotten any curl, just kind of give it a bend or you may just want to let it set for a couple of days between some wax paper stacked under a big heavy stack of books just to make sure. Another thing is I typically would not go right in and seal something like this right away. You're going to really want everything to dry and set at least for a couple of days before you seal it. Okay, it just depends on what you're using, but uh, I'm gonna go ahead and do it and take my chances. If something smudges, this is kind of a smudgy project anyway. Okay, so what I do is just open the top. This is so much fun. And start from the middle. And remember, I just wanna make sure this is tilting downwards and not going in and making a puddle. So I'm gonna pour slow, start in the middle, and just kind of swirl it around. I'm not extending yet. I'm gonna really fill up this middle and let it start to ooze out. So it's, it's, it's gonna start traveling. I must be on a little bit of a hill because it wants to come this way. So you see, I can see that it's going that way a little bit. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a little paper underneath my tray. Now I stopped it. So I can just kind of watch and see the direction it's going in. I want it to be pretty even. I don't want it to, you know, run one specific way. So still in the middle. I'm not going around the edge. I'm staying in the middle here, okay? Filling it in and then letting it kind of, letting it work its way out. If you want, you could take that palette knife and barely skim the top and help it along a little bit. And it's gonna go into all those nooks and crevices, all those crannies, but we gotta give it time. You hear it starting to run off the edge? I'm gonna lift this side of my tray just a little bit. I'm just stuffing little papers underneath my tray, just trying to get it really even. And see, I'm just doing a little bit at a time. And I can go and pick up what's gone down onto the tray a little bit with my palette knife and reuse it. I need a little more on the corner over here. So 
so it does take quite a bit but it's almost like um what do you call that finish that's really really thick that you have to mix the two parts together i forget what that's called what is that called i always forget somebody tell me what's it called Deb Ocasio, I would definitely save the runoff. In fact, when I did the one that I showed before, some of the runoff is back in this. This is not cheap. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to save that runoff. And you kind of got to be generous with it to make sure you get all of your nooks and crannies covered. And then what you would do is just leave this for a couple of days. Um, Annette says, why can't you brush it on? Well, um, you could. Resin, yes, that's what it reminds me of. It reminds me of resin, except it's not. Epoxy resin, yes. So this is what that reminds me of, except it's not resin. So um, somebody asked, why can't you brush it on? Um, I tried brushing on before, and I it just wasn't the same. Like, you're going to get a little bit of a gloss finish, just like you would if you sprayed it. But if you want that really nice and thick, kind of like an epoxy resin finish, which is what what it's like the first example that I showed pouring it on is much much better much better effect and so there's a cloudiness to it right now but that's going to dry clear Beth just tuned in she's asking what I'm using I'm using Liquitex acrylic mediums high gloss varnish and I will say yeah and brush marks too Terry um I will say that it doesn't have a strong odor like there's a little bit of an odor but when you compare it to like a resin or a spray or something like that, I don't feel like there's a terrible odor. Although I would recommend that you do it in a well-ventilated area because I can't imagine it's super safe to inhale. So I'm just tilting it just a smidge. Everything's kind of coated and covered. So I'm just tilting it and make sure it's not pulling there in the middle. See how it was kind of cloudy in the middle? I just want to make sure I don't have it pulling there. And the cool thing is when it sets overnight, everything will continue to just settle. You can kind of already see how cool it's going to be. So there it is. And what happens, I'm going to put that to the side. And this is how it will end up. Isn't it gorgeous? Like, it just feels like a finished work of art. But again, somebody said, for the price, you can't beat spray. True. Absolutely true. And there's also some sprays that give you a really nice, shiny finish. Well, you know, but we started with the scrap chipboard from the back of a pad of paper. Then we used on our background some ripped out book pages. Then we just smushed around a little bit of alcohol ink. And then we came in from with the, some Distress ink and we did some rubber stamping with some different colored paints. We used brown paper scrap bags, like grocery bags or packing material, to just smush some paint around to make our pumpkin sections and our stems. And then we just came in with a tiny amount of paint to just kind of finish it off. Really, really inexpensive. Really, really fun and satisfying techniques that provide a surprising result, a satisfying result every single time. And so if I wanted to put a little bit extra into my finish, I don't have any guilt about it because it wasn't super expensive to make. Also, all of the work and effort and joy that I put into it, it's worth, you know, salvaging. One thing I forgot to do on the project that we just finished today was sign it. So I'll probably sign the back. However, I did sign the bottom of this one 
So really quick, just a reminder, sign your artwork before you seal it. Sandra says, Ranger makes a product called Glossy Accents that you can pour on and it gives about the same effect as what you're getting. I will have to look into that and see which one is more cost effective. Maybe we'll test that out. You can buy acrylic paints at the Dollar Tree. Absolutely. And you can, when you, for acrylic paints, you really only need the primary colors and a black and a white. You can mix your colors using those. Anne says, true, cheap project for the most part, very nice. And Anne, I try to do that with every project that I teach, everything that I do. It should be economical. And especially in the times that we're in now, if people can't get out or they don't want to go out, it's fun to just use what you've got. And I did date it, Kathleen. Yep, sign it and date it. <clears throat> I usually just put the year. So there we go. Part four of our Mixed Media Fall Festival is come to a close. So join me tomorrow, same time, same place. Just a reminder, we are closing the doors to the Creative Sisterhood Maker Bees membership tomorrow night at midnight. That's it. That's the last chance before spring of 2021. Okay? Thank you, Anne. I appreciate that. Patty says, any advice on toning down alcohol ink? Dark blotches a day after it was applied, even possible? Well, probably not after it's already been done and dried. Um, while you're putting it on, especially when you're putting it on that paper, um, you just want it to be wet, very, very wet, and smush it really fast. Don't let it settle in too fast. And when I was talking about that the other day, I, I was saying, like, it drops onto your surface, and it will leave a dot if you don't move it quickly. I also squirted some of the alcohol ink directly onto my wet paintbrush and then smushed it around. You're welcome, Jacqueline. Yay. Be sure and go join the free group. Or Jacqueline, you're in the membership. You're in the membership, so share it over there. And I will talk to you guys probably, definitely tomorrow. And I may be on tonight here on Artists Unlimited with um, some tips and tricks about my creative space and how I stay organized. Tracy says, I have a question about Distress Ink. I can only find Distress Oxide. Okay, there is a difference. Distress Ink is transparent. Distress Oxide is more opaque. You're going to get more coverage with a, with a Distress Oxide. It's almost like acrylic paint. So there is a difference. Um, I get mine on Amazon, and actually I just ordered some last week, so I would try there. You're welcome, Rebecca. I'm so glad you like it, Kathy. I'm glad you joined us. <clears throat> Okay. Have a great day, everybody. I'm so excited to see what you make. And I'll talk to you soon. Hope to see you inside the sisterhood. Bye. Okay. See you later.